high performance teams can show you the best of two worlds when things get difficult. These are the people you'd want to have around, but also the worst of that world, which means they become very, very difficult to manage if there's nothing, if, if, if there's not enough work to go around. So the idea of going to Gambastian came from uh, my overall interest in trying to understand how people continue to coordinate in very difficult circumstances. So when the pressure gets on, do they become more clear-headed? Do they go for default responses, um, as is often the case in human nature? Um, essentially, I mean, what, what do people what do people get up to in extreme environments? And the assumption I'm making, which may well be a, a wrong one, is that um, if you put people under pressure collectively, they um, you're able to see the same sort of tensions that might exist in teams in ordinary life, but in a way that's slightly exacerbated. So the world becomes a bit more black and white. I wanted to try and understand what makes for uh, a very effective team in the very difficult circumstances, and the opposite of that. And so what allows some teams to be more effective, better at coordinating when things get difficult than other teams. In an ideal world, you go in with a blank slate, uh, but we're human beings, which means that we, we bring our own preconceptions and prejudices to, to the field. Uh, and I'm no exception to that. Um, I try to prepare myself as well as I could for the language they speak, the kind of conversations they might have by reading up on the medical literature, reading biographies, autobiographies of surgeons, people that had either practiced in an ordinary NHS-type hospital or out in the field. Um, and that will have given me some expectations as to what I might expect, but you know, the overriding rationale was to try and understand the kind of language they might be using um, uh, a little bit better from day one so as to hit, hit the ground running. Um, but irrespective of that, I mean, whatever environment you go into, you, you'll never be as clean as a newborn baby. You'd love to be, but you're not. We are what we are. And I think key is for us to be aware of the kind of preconceptions we may bring to the field, to be very, very clear about this. And so what I do, um, which helps me a great deal, is to keep uh, not only a field diary, but also keep head notes or a head diary. So on one page, I write down literally what I observe, and I try to record it even for beta me where I can. On the other page, typically, or a different diary, I might write down what this I'm thinking about at the time, what I dream about. Um, because even what I dream about, particularly when they take the form of anxiety dreams, they may give me um, a sense as to where I might need to be very careful in looking at my data to make sure that what I attribute to you, if, if you're the one I'm observing, is actually uh, really part of you and not something that happens to be part of me that I'm simply superimposing on yourself. It's called counter-transference, but, but it's something you need to be very, very careful, uh, careful about. I think I was surprised to see how unstable surgical teams become when there isn't enough work to go around. They are the most effective teams that I think I've ever seen anywhere when a casualty comes in. A typical casualty nowadays is a, is a bilateral amputee, so with both legs gone, often the, the groin area will be open as well. These are very serious injuries, and these people will bleed out if you don't intervene very, very quickly. And teams, I can't see how you could possibly better the teams that I've seen, because they're very, very good. The problem is when sometimes days go by and not much comes in, which is good news because it means the boys are safe. It's bad news for the surgeons because there's nothing much else to do aside from doing a bit of fitness. And these are people that are programmed to work hard and they find it very difficult to sit still. Um, and so they then have a tendency to become reflective, reflective about the war, reflective about the relative futility of a lot of the work that they do, particularly with local nationals, Afghans that they treat. A lot of people coming into the, into the hospital are not all soldiers. They tend to be uh, local nationals, and many of them are children. And these are people that you treat up to a certain point to hand them over to a local hospital, where invariably many of them won't fare well, and we know that, because the local standard of health care is so much lower in Afghanistan generally, even in the best hospitals, than it is in Bastion. Best is only 50 bed hospital, we need to keep those beds free for the, for the soldiers um, as much as we can. And so you find surgeons become quite reflective for the fact that actually they do a lot of work for people that probably won't survive anyway, simply by virtue of handing them over to a local healthcare system. Um, they can also become very, um, very critical, not only of their own work, but of the work of people around them, because they now have time to think about those sorts of issues. They may intervene with each other's patients. And so I think I was surprised by the fact that high-performance teams can 
show you the best of two worlds when things get difficult. These are the people you'd want to have around, but also the worst of that world, which means they become very, very difficult to manage if there's nothing, if, if, if there's not enough work to go around. And that's politically not, uh, politically very difficult situation because if you recommend that a hospital uh, do away with some of their headcount, some of their capacity, what if a helicopter comes down and you need all the surgeons to be on the spot? And so politically you need the kind of capacity they have at the moment. The problem is that you then also, from a management perspective, you've got to understand how to deal with a relative sense of futility and how to deal with boredom. Uh, and that is, that is uh, or can be a real struggle for people in charge. The experience in Bastion reminded me of a problem that we often find in organizations, which is a lack of psychological safety. Uh, meaning that if I'm the most junior person in the room, that I should be able to speak out and say, you know what, let's stop this, or let's take a time out. Something isn't quite right, and here's what I think we ought to do, and here's why. And take a risk, I might actually be wrong. Um, now, these stakes in Cambastian are so high that I would expect these places to be perfectly safe psychologically, and I think they're probably a lot safer than our NHS hospitals, but they're not as safe as I thought they would be. Meaning that there were still people that somehow worried about the, the consequences of speaking out when retrospectively they felt they, they, they should have done. It's a very common phenomenon in most organizations because most organizations aren't very safe psychologically. We've got plenty of evidence for this. I think I had expected um, less evidence of a place being psychologically not as safe as it, it could or should be in the operating theaters in Bastion. I think, frankly, a lot of people we deal with, a lot of people we teach are bored people. You know? Boredom is not just a function, as I just explained, of, um, of not having enough work to do. You can be bored and have lots of work to do. You're simply bored because the work you do isn't meaningful. And frankly, a lot of people I think that I, uh, gosh, that I teach almost on a, a weekly, if not almost a daily basis, are people that, that tend to be very well off, with good careers in the legal profession, in professional services. In industry, and they're, I think, very bored people by and large. Bored primarily because they've got lots of stuff to do, but it isn't particularly meaningful in any way they can see. Cambastian is the size of Reading, so you're, you know, Cambastian is the size of a small city. Um, what's interesting, and I think what's, what struck me in a very positive way about Bastion, is that for the the, 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 um, the vigils that are held every Tuesday night for servicemen, British servicemen that, that happen to have gotten killed in duty, um, those are attended by thousands of people, um, including the civilians that work in Bastion. I think that's very nice. So on the Tuesday evenings, I'm not sure if it's a matter of discipline as much as a matter of people actually caring about what happens. They'll come together at 10 past 6 on a Tuesday evening for... Um, for a service which will ultimately culminate in the, the human remains being sent back to the UK. And that's very, very nice to see. And again, you know, part of it, it will be people being disciplined to do this. I think a, a large part of it is people being very keen to be part of this. Now, there's an exception to this. And the exception is interesting because the exception, to some extent, are some of the surgeons that work in the hospital. It's emotionally very difficult for them to... to see people who might have died either before arriving in hospitals, so they might have died in the field, or they might have died on the operating ta table or in recess. Um, because what the repatriation service does, the remembrance service does, is to um, make, to give these, to give these soldiers back a sense of humanity. You, you know. um, it's kind of hard to express, but I think in the operating theater, you have the luxury of draping cloths over a body and operating only in the relevant parts. And that's dehumanizing for a good reason. It, it, it allows surgeons to be very effective and not worry about or wonder about who it is that happens to be operated on. Um, it is why surgeons find it difficult to visit the intensive care units, for example, because then they become human again. You, know, you see a face, that face may move, that face may talk. Um, and many of them prefer not to be that close to the people they treat. And that's probably why some of them will, in fact, try and, if they can, uh, find something else to do other than attend that service, because it's difficult.